circle of three people. Every more free than the Blues Festival, I was there today and had a nasty Okay. Just a show of hands, who's here for the first time? Oh, was it? Wow. Welcome. That's, that's awesome. Well, my name's Peter Manning. I'm just going to introduce um, the uh, agenda for the, this evening. I just feel that we've got a lot of momentum happening, you know, in this community. And uh, it's really exciting to be a part of it. I mean, the, we had 80, 80 tickets allocated initially, and they were snapped up in a couple of days. And we had a few emails saying, can't get tickets. It's because you're too slow. <laughs> now, just while right along that thing, I know some people haven't been getting the emails, and there's a reason for that. And if you, um, under the privacy thing, we can't just take a name on a, on a sheet of paper and then load it up into the system. You've got to go onto our web page, which is goldcoastcommonlaw.com. Now, the one there says, yes, I want to opt in. You press that, fill in your details. It will then generate an email to you, which you have to opt in again. So people, I think people are doing the first stage, and they're actually unsubscribed. They're not getting the emails. It's very important that you fill in your details. When you, you get the email back to you, do you want to opt in? And that's the actual yes, please, that we can then send you information under the Privacy Act, okay? Goldcoastcommonlaw.com. So I've tried it myself. I unsubscribed and I subscribed again and it works. Any time along the system, you can unsubscribe if you don't want to hear from us again. But that way you'll hear about all our meetings and what's going on in the community. Okay. Now, Michael, this is over here that's given us the use of his premises. He runs a fantastic salsa and dance school here. And for our group only, he's offered to give his first lesson free. Now, whether you're on your own or you're a couple, you want to come and learn to dance, please grab a business card or see me later and we can set you up. So, he's promoting us, we love to promote him as well, okay? Now, does anyone know the story back in the global financial crisis of Iceland? I want to tell you a really encouraging story about Iceland. You won't hear about this in the main news, okay? In 2008, Iceland, it's only a little country, 330,000 people. However, they have a model that we should copy. In Iceland, we all know where it is up in the northern things of Alaska, is known for its aluminium smelting, fishing and tourism. In 2008, the global financial crisis sent all businesses completely bankrupt. People marched the streets. We've seen a little bit of that lately, haven't we? But all the people I've seen marched the streets. They'd had enough. The government at the time was overthrown and the politicians were arrested. You won't hear this in the news. This is exactly what happened. They then gathered people from all provinces and communities to form a new government for the people, to represent the people. Then they rewrote their constitution. How good is that? The new government for the people only bailed out their own citizens by way of household debt relief. They paid everyone's debts out. First of all, they decided they were not going to pay the debts of the corrupt bankers, the banks. Unlike other countries, other countries like America and Australia bailed out the banks. Okay? And guess who wore that debt? Now, they introduced currency controls and let all the current banks fail because they were corrupt and they just did illegal loans everywhere. The corrupt bankers were then sent to jail. Where have you ever heard that? Okay. Currently, women now play a major role in all Icelandic decision making for the government. Women. Absolutely. It's just fantastic, unheard of. I'm, not, I'm just saying that's a really, really good thing. The country now is under 100% renewable energy. 
and their economic growth year on year on is 5%. And they only have an unemployment rate of 1%. There's a minimum wage of $25 an hour for everybody, and they work a 30 hour a week. They have a great education system, a top medical system, and Iceland is now performing much better than any other country in the European Union. Now, is that a model that we'd like to have? Yeah. Yes. yes. Right? Now, I know it's only small, 330,000 people, but numbers, it's all about the people. Yeah. So, um, I just thought I'd encourage you that with that story. There's a lot more to it, so look it up where you can. Go, go for all the guff, try and find the truth out of what's going on, on out there. And what's interesting now, the experts are saying, they don't know how Iceland's doing it. <laughs> right? um, they haven't asked the people, have they? All right. Um, thank you also too for your generous donations to the, um, to the box at the door. I'd now like to introduce Simone from the McPherson Electric Community Lobby Group. Thanks, Sam. everyone. Just to let you know that um, the McPherson Electric um, Community Group, we hold um, a meeting on Monday nights every fortnight. So we've got one coming up this Monday night if you're in the McPherson area. And um, we've got a couple of items that we'd like um, Ross Bates to do for us, our will. And um, I'm looking for a renter crowd. So um, if I can get names, if anyone wants to support me, so I'm not going down there and there's crickets around me while I'm trying to do this, <laughs> I'd love um, your support. So I've got a, a um, clipboard here. If you want to put your name and number, and um, I can give you, a, you know, like a text message just to say, look, she's in town, she's in the office. Uh, these are the days that we're looking at. Can you come down just for a quick... Uh, stand at the front of the office to uh, show that we mean business. So um, some of the items on the agenda is uh, the 90 years suppression order that the government's uh, hiding the names of the uh, pedophiles in the government. Um, also the, the hot topic is the vaccine passports. So um, we, we are using that letter from, um, uh, from Reunite Democracy, was it? Yeah. yeah. And then um, just a few other items on the list. So it's a great idea if um, anyone in different electorate areas to start forming groups and to start um, actioning and talking to your local MP, showing up as groups. Um, it's been fantastic for our group and we come here and learn um, everything we can here and then back out into the um, area and action whatever we can. So I'll pass this around and please, um, looking for your help. Just uh, to come and join me when the time's right. Thank you. And next is me. Thank you. Can you hear me all? Yes. Okay, I've got a couple of um, announcements that you now. Is that better? Okay, great. Um, who enjoyed Zev?
how that's happening, when that's happening, what's involved. So that's, uh, but you have to opt in in our um, website as Pete talked about. The other thing I just want to touch on um, tonight and just share with you is that, you know, common law is the gateway to your rights. And that's why we're all gathering here. There is such a big movement, a groundswell. I don't know if you can feel it. I can. I'm just like, wow, this is just dynamite. And the beauty is, it's about us. Us, the people. We, the people. We have the power and we need to let the government know that we do know we have the power. We're going to turn this on its head. What like what they've done in Alaska. So um, with that, I want to introduce um, someone that is incredible as well, has his own TV, YouTube TV, and we are, incre I feel incredibly um, humbled and grateful at the people that are wanting to come and share with us. And, and share their information and, and equip us. And with equipping us, we can equip others because it's, it, that's how the universe works. It's like you give, you receive. And, you know, we're, we're coming into a time where the right heart, integrity and honour is number one. And it's not going to be about agendas and egos and how much money I can make out of this. Those days are going. And I would like to say they're gone. And this is where we're connecting with like-minded people. And I want to encourage you to get to know the people beside you. Start sharing what you know, the areas of influence that you can impact. Not everyone has an upfront um, aspect. But your family and your surroundings, your workplace, is the place of your governance. Because who you are actually affects that environment. And this is what we're starting to tap into and starting to educate people. We, none of us are you know, obsolete. None of us are too old. None of us are too young. And that's what excites me, because we're in this together. And we've all got something amazing to share and bring and take away. So on that note, Tom Barnett is going to rock our socks off tonight. <laughs> Otherwise, we're bringing out the great free song again. <laughs> we're going to hand it over to him. We want to give him as much time. And I hope you really enjoy it. Grab hold of it, link into what he's got on YouTube. It's great, great stuff. It's incredible. And the more you listen to it, the more proficient you become in it. So that when you are facing something, you know that you know how to stand in it. Yeah? So can we give Tom a hand? Okay, welcome. Thanks for having me here. A lot of people say, I'm really looking forward to your talk, and I always say, so do I. Because uh, you never know what I'm going to say until I get up. So we just kind of read what people are up to. I understand there's a lot of people who are quite familiar with a lot of the basics, and other people, are, they're quite new to this. So for some of you, it'll be a reiteration of what you already know. But when I was learning this, I learned from Mark Vitelli from Solutions Empowerment. I used to do the trips up and back from the Gold Coast to attend the workshops. And every time I would record it, which you're welcome to do if you want to voice record or video, whatever you want to do. And I would go back over it many times because I would always pick up hearing the basics over and over and over. I would continue to not just reinforce what I knew, but really pick up new things. There's always something new to be learned in basics. It's like if anybody plays music or any kind of sport, it's like any time you get really proficient, you realize you're just coming back to basics. It's not about the fancy stuff. It's literally basics, basics, basics is what gets you through the door every time. So one of the areas that I'm talking about a lot, by the way, if nobody knows Zeb, he's a mate of mine, uh, I do recommend if you wanna learn how to go through paperwork really proficiently, he's, he's great at that. I actually don't do any of that stuff. If somebody wants to know how to get out of a fine or taxes, I don't touch that at all. What I do is I work with people on how to communicate. 
Simply, who are you? Who are you really? And then how do you hold that as a standing when you are communicating with people in the public realm? So we're holding ourselves in the private realm and we're communicating constantly. We're not bothered about other people in the private. What we're dealing with here is we're dealing with people in the public. So for those that aren't aware, there's essentially two realms and then mirror, mirror images of one another. There's the public and there's the private. Now, all of this also, by the way, comes from the Bible. Whether you think the Bible's great or it's nothing worth you know, writing home about, doesn't matter. That's where our laws are written from, and they also come from natural law. So it's similar to genders, where there are only two genders. It doesn't matter if you associate or you identify with something else. Only men and women have rights. And in the world of holding your own and holding on to your rights, there are only two realms, public and private. You can't be in both. Did I just lose the signal? It might be there. Oh, there you, go. you might have to hold it. Still working? Yeah, yeah. still working. Yeah. Okay, so when we're dealing with the realm that we're in, it's our choice. And we can move ourselves out of it by the way that we speak or keep ourselves in it, again, by the way that we speak. So first of all, though, we need to know who we are. And that's what I mostly talk to people about, is coming to that understanding and that knowing of who we are in the first place, why we have rights, and then simply how to hold them. Because it's not really about learning so much new stuff, it's really about remembering who we are. Everybody can feel it. You know, Our ancestors have been around for a long time, gone through more than what we're going through today. We think the world's kind of a bit bent right now, but it's not the worst that it's ever been. And we've come through it before, and that's in our blood. So if we can tap back into that, which we can at any time, we tend to remember what we are and who we are, and it gives us a much greater set, like a center from where everything else comes from. Think about if you've ever been in an altercation with somebody or you want to get your point across, you've got a bit of an argument going, and if you're up here in your chest, and you're up here in your throat, you're all in your head, tends not to go too well. As opposed to if you're sitting in your center and you're feeling things as opposed to being too much in the mind, it goes a lot better. Everybody in this room would have had that experience. So that's what we want to draw on when we're learning how to communicate and hold ourselves in the private realm. So what is the private? Well, as I said, there are two realms, public and private. They are mirror images of one another. So in the private, we have men and women. In the public, the mirror image of men and women is persons. Is anyone in here a person? Good. No one's a person. A person is an entity. So in the living, or in the world of the, uh, the private, that's the world of the living, the world of substance. Men and women are living. We're living beings. Persons, on the other hand, are entities. So an entity is not living and also has no rights. In the world of the private, we have rights. Those are inalienable. We are given those by virtue of simply being here. The mirror image of that in the public is benefits and privileges. So as a living being, we reserve our rights. But if we associate or we use our words the wrong way, we agree to being a person, we agree to being a name, an entity, and we essentially become surety for that, or we in engage in what's called joinder, which is when we attach us, the living being, to the name. That's called joinder. Therefore, now you, the flesh and blood, are liable for anything that that name, the entity, is liable for. So what could you be liable for? Fines, taxes, it's pretty much the main things, <laughs> but also being told what you can and can't do. Wear a mask, quarantine, take a PCR test, anything like that. Any act relates to persons. If you read through any act in Australia or around the world, in the Commonwealth at least, they all refer to persons. They are creatures of statute. In the private we have law or laws, and there are only two. It boils down to two. Boils down to love thy neighbour and love thy creator, which essentially comes down to common sense and being a good person and not causing harm or loss. Now when I say, for example, a good person, when we're talking about private, anything in the private realm, it's, all, it's okay to call each other a person. It's like, oh, he's a great person. She's such a nice person. That's fine. Why? Because we're dealing in the private. And this is the key, because when we switch that over to being in the public, we certainly do not ever want to refer to ourselves or our young, for example, or anyone in our family as a person. Why don't we want to do that? Because when we use that word, we put ourselves into the public, which is a different jurisdiction. It means you come under statutory rule. Remember, there's only two laws, love thy neighbor, love thy creator. 
Over in the world of the public, though, there's over 7 million acts, codes, statutes, legislations, bills. And if you want to try to remember all of those, or try to come under those, that's what happens if you're a person. If you operate in that realm. So how do we avoid putting ourselves in the public and maintain ourselves in the private? Well, part of it is just a little bit of basic knowledge on the words that we speak and how we relate to ourselves. And the rest is just following a few very simple rules. There's really only three. One, you don't answer questions. You can use that literally in any situation. If somebody in the public realm is making you an offer, and we'll get to offers in commerce, but they're making you an offer such as I need you to go and stand over here. What's your name? Here's a fine. Here's some taxes. Those are all offers in commerce. So if we simply don't know what we're doing and we say, with respect, I don't answer questions. We maintain our rights in the private. If we answer to a question, we are engaging in commerce. Answering a question is what a debtor does. So we'll move into debtors and creditors in a moment, but that's just to set the scene. Answering to a name is the second thing that we'll never want to do. It's equivalent to answering a question, but agreeing to being a name is suicide in that world. So, that, so uh, that means if somebody ever asked me, for example, let's say, are you Tom Barnett? Does anybody know what a typical response would be for that? They ask you your name. Yeah, what if... What, okay, if you say yes, what are you doing? Yeah, join your ring. If you say no, what are you doing? You're, you're still contracting, you're still falling into this world of uh, contracts, offers, and acceptance. That's a full acceptance. Or it's refusal, which in commerce is actually dishonorable. We'll get into that. So what I say is I say, do you have some evidence for that? I'm not agreeing to being a name and I'm not disagreeing. Those are the two things that we want to get out of the habit of doing. The reason for that is that as young men and women, boys and girls, we grow up hopefully with manners. And we're taught that if we're, we're spoken to, we answer the question. Is it not rude for me to speak to somebody? And then you just don't say anything back. You know, that's rude in our society. So we're taught to communicate a certain way. But in the world of the public, which is we're dealing with legalities... It's actually a completely different way of communicating. So we think we're being polite by answering questions, but what we're really doing is we're, we're either contracting or forming agreements. We want to avoid doing that. It's really important. It's actually learning a completely different way of communicating in almost a separate language. May as well be Spanish or something. Because what we think we're speaking in English, oftentimes we're babbling. We actually don't know what we're saying. We might think that we're saying one thing, but in a legal sense, we might be saying the complete opposite. Same with the public and private, the two mirror image opposite worlds. What we think we're saying in English, we're probably communicating the exact opposite of what we think we're saying. Similar to anything you hear in the mainstream, if the mainstream tells you something's happening, probably the opposite of true is true. If they tell you that you need to wear a mask to be healthy or eat a certain way, if you invert that and do the opposite, you'll likely be 100% better off. We live in that world of inversions and the public and private realm are no different. So let's get into commerce quickly, and we'll come back to the name thing. Commerce is essentially what we're dealing with all the time. It comes from the law of the sea, maritime. And then that was brought as we were colonised, different countries were colonised, and started to be brought onto the land, and started to disturb the natural law and the natural customs of the lands. And that's the world we find ourselves in today, basically built on Freemasonry. So what we're doing is when we can understand that we are dealing with agreements and contracts, we can learn how to communicate effectively within that realm. The first thing to realize is that there is nothing that we are bound to without our consent. Nobody can get us to do anything without our consent. It might not seem that way because oftentimes it looks like we're being coerced into things without any power, right? It can seem like that. It only seems like that because we inadvertently agree or assent, which is an unconscious decision to agree, and we put ourselves in that standing in the public and we subvert ourselves to their power, which they don't have by nature. We give it to them, whether we know it or not. So learning about commerce is essentially just learning how to deal with agreements, contracts, and offers. So in the world of commerce, there are only two roles. Like, there are only two genders. And like, there are only the public and the private. There's no in-between. So those roles in commerce is that we have creditors and we have debtors. That's it. 
Only those two. So how we distinguish ourselves is how we act. A creditor asks questions or they direct what's going on. And a debtor, as you can imagine, answers questions. They take orders. They follow. So it's really subtle. I'll go through a few role plays later where you'll see the subtleties in communication and how we can inadvertently become the debtor because that's how we're trained. We're actually trained or indoctrinated to be debtors in commerce. And what we want to do is just relearn actually only a few very simple key points to become creditors in the world of commerce. And that also means standing in the world of the private. In the private, remember, we have rights. They can't be taken away. As soon as we become a debtor and we become somebody in the fiction or the public realm, those go away. And now we're subject to uh, statutory rules and laws, but we also give ourselves up to having benefits and privileges. So remember, only a free man can reserve his rights. Does a slave have rights? That's, that's just the definition of being a slave. You don't have rights if you're a slave. Does an entity, Sorry. Does an entity have rights? Only the living have rights. So we're going to go through the subtleties of how we make a very clear distinction between the two. And that's what my work is all about. It's simply coming to that realization of who we are and coming from there. I think learning these, learning the skills, I guess you call it, these tools are very powerful. But with that comes a responsibility. And everything I talk about always, whether you've seen me on a, in a video on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, I'm always talking about responsibility. And responsibility is key because there's actually no notice in the world that you can carry around that'll do your work for you. There's no magic cloud you can flash that'll do your work for you. Because in this world of commerce, those that run the show, they have every right to test you. Does somebody have the right to ask you to wear a mask or scan a QR code? No. 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 Who, who thinks yes, who thinks no? So who, who, who says no first? All right, who thinks yes? About half up. They do have a right to ask. They actually do. Do you have the right to reserve your rights and either not answer or not consent or ask a question back? Yes. So that's what we're dealing with. And a lot of people get confused about thinking that we can't be asked to do things. Hey, pay some taxes. Hey, pay this fine. Scan that QR code, put a mask on. They can ask that all day. They're more than welcome to. They have every right to test us because it actually does us a favor. It's like I always use the analogies of, say, martial arts or surfing or anything that somebody might be familiar with. You might think you're at a certain level, but then if you're never tested, it's all just theory. And a lot of what we hear about in this true law, common law, natural law realm, a lot of it is actually theory. Until you, get, until you practice things and you get tested, you, have, you don't actually know who you are. And it's a real gift to be tested because... When you do find out who you are, and it becomes a realization and a knowing, not just something that you think, a theory that you've heard, never practiced, it puts you in a really strong standing. You know, we go from needing notices and cards and, and all rights reserved passports and whatever to not needing anything because we are it. It's us. It's not what we carry around with us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the power. What we're doing is we're aiming to increase our individual power. It's not learning so much of the words to speak, although they are necessary and it's part of the learning process. But what it's really leading to is building up our own sense of individual power, where we exude that everywhere we go. So we can walk around, we can walk among masked people and they don't have an effect on us. We don't feel any kind of either um, disconnect from them, whether it's positive or negative. We don't feel any oppression from them. We just are. And a lot of the times we'll see that they will act differently around us if we hold that. But that's a work in progress and that's what we're working towards. So the languaging is super important. Personally, I don't remember things like section this of the, of the uh, constitution or, or section that of some act. I'm aware of some, but I don't really go there. The reason is because I'm not making any claims. And that's the other main rule of commerce and of staying in the public or the private. If you make a claim, who bears burden of proof to back that up? You yeah, you do. Whoever makes a claim bears burden of proof. Now, that can get you into a lot of trouble if you don't get that because you might start saying something like, I don't have to do that, or that act says that I don't have to do this, or I don't have to wear a mask, you can't make me scan a code. If we start making claims, we have to back that up. Now, there's a rule that comes from the Bible 
or verse, and it says that the truth can only be told out of the mouths of two or more people. Is anyone in this room two or more people? Yeah. Who's two or more people? <laughs> <laughs> on the soul, on the soul of the living. Yeah, but it's so when we're talking about people, we're we're only one. And if we if we try to say the truth, we're not. We'll babble, and we can actually that can go really bad places in a courtroom, for example. So what we need to do is we need to use a second witness principle, and that means getting somebody else to agree with us or to make the statement. Then you're not on your own. It actually can get you in a lot of trouble when you do start making claims without backing it up. So the way we do that is we simultaneously become a creditor in commerce and we maintain our standing with our rights when we simply ask questions. No matter what is brought to us or somebody makes a claim, you have to scan here or you have to do that, you have to put a mask on. Rather than go to our default English communication and say, well, no, I don't, or something to that effect, we come back with a question. Can anyone give me an example of a good question that they're used to asking, that they've learned? What about evidence? Do you have some evidence for that? Any evidence? Yep. Is there proof that people have died from COVID? Any kind of proof of claim. Really, that's interesting. Do you have some evidence for that? Can you prove that? Nobody thinks to, to get people to, to back anything up. But it's so key in this world. People are incriminating themselves all of the time in the public realm. All of the time. Day in, day out. And they continue to do it because nobody really pulls them up and says something like, well, that's an interesting uh, claim you've got there. Have you got some evidence for that? Or they ask you a question. You know, whatever the question is, if you can learn to come back with a question, then we're in good stead. So just to recap, we don't answer questions, we don't agree to being a name, and we don't make claims. Those are the fundamentals of maintaining our status in the private and maintaining our status as a creditor in the world of commerce. Now, there are some very useful ways that we can implement that prevents us from contracting unknowingly. So if we're confused about whether we... how oh, I, I can only say yes or no, what do I do? We use an impartial statement. An impartial statement might sound like, well, we can get to that. Or maybe that's true, maybe that's not. You know, something that's impartial. Some, anything that is anything but a definite yes or a definite no. That can save us... So much hassle. So we'll do a little bit of role play after we set the same. We'll get a few people that want to practice this. So for example, I'll give you a quick monologue role play. Somebody asks me my name, I'll, they say, you Tom Barnett. And I'll say, well, do you have some evidence for that? And I'll say, don't play games. I know who you are. Here it is. It's on your, it's on your license or your passport or something. I'll say, really? I said, is that me? Notice how I haven't answered to being anything yet or I haven't made any claims. Just a question. Is that me? Look, mate, I'm not going to stand here and listen to this. If you've been belligerent, I'm going to arrest you. I say, well, look, I don't want to cause any trouble. Just ask you a question. How is that me? Is that not a photograph of me? How is that me? Because that's all it is, right? Am I a piece of plastic? Am I a photograph? I'm not. I'm me. It's the same as if you get a speeding fine from a camera. There's a stationary car in the photo. How is the car speeding? A lot of people don't think to just come down to very basic elements of common sense by asking the questions. They're looking always, they're looking for us to incriminate ourselves by getting us to agree to something, even if it's to be in a name. That's incriminating ourselves. But there is no law in the land that requires us to incriminate ourselves. So we can always ask questions back. So a quick monologue role play would be something like somebody asked me, um, you know, where's your mask, right? I say, well, I'm exempt. Thanks very much for asking. I'm on my way. Remember, they have a right to ask. That's why I'm not going to back chat. In this situation, I'm answering with a question because, uh, sorry, I'm actually answering the question. Well, I'm not, I'm just making a statement. But the reason that this is safe and the reason I use this example is that you're now backed up by what? Medical privacy, right? No one can ask really what that, people do ask, but they have no right to ask that, right? They can't force you to provide that kind of information. This is really the only time when you are protected by something in real law that prevents people from it asking that. So I'm using this example. So they'll say, well, you have to provide that. I need to see it. And this is where we get into commerce. And say, really, that's interesting. Do you have some evidence for that? What sort? What is your source of authority to ask me to provide you with a medical exemption? Are you a doctor? What is your medical qualification? Are you not a shopkeeper or a security guard or a police officer? So all I'm doing is I might ask, I might ask three questions in a row. The reason I do that is that if you put yourself in the receiving end of that, 
One question. Well, what source of authority do you have? Just feel how that feels. But then if I ask, well, what's your source of authority? Do you have some kind of medical qualification? What is that exactly? Can you provide that to me? Or are you in fact a shopkeeper, security guard, or a police officer? How does it feel being asked three questions in a row compared to one? Confusing. It's different, right? It's a lot more powerful. It's, it's a lot more disempowering to be on the receiving end of that. So the way we ask questions is also important, but it's never attacking. It's never going after them on a personal level. It's simply holding our position of being quite firm, but never impolite and never disrespectfully. Because if we do that, we're now entering into a realm we don't want to be, which is belligerence. And that can be held against us. Did you want to ask a question? I was just going to say, in South Australia, they actually passed it that um, you need to show your exemption. So I got caught out like that at the airport and got fined for it. Yep. So it was a police officer that asked me for the exemption. He said, you must show me. And then fine me $1,000 dollars. Yeah, right. So, well, Zev's the guy that can get you. When you learn Zev's process, he'll get you out of that. I'm going through it. Mate. Yeah, cool. I'm not used to it yet. All right, so we can avoid getting to that in the first place because sometimes you'll hear somebody speak, like maybe me tonight or somebody else in the future, and you'll run back a past experience and you go, damn it, I should have just said that. <laughs> that would have prevented that from happening. But we always go through the experiences that we need to learn from. So remember that if we can hold that position, and that's what it's called, holding position, those people like police officers, for example, are masters at getting people into their realm of the public and answering their questions. You watch what they do, they're directing all of the time. And as polite people, the way we're brought up, we don't want to cause confrontation. We don't want to have any kind of fuss. And we'll get a bit flustered and we'll answer questions, or we'll hand over an identification, when we actually are under no obligation to do so. But they make it feel like we have to. And that's, the, that's their art. It's that psychological warfare. So by role-playing, which is what I highly recommend people do, by role-playing, having somebody ask you the questions and then you think of your way to come around it, but then have them say, no, I'm not listening to that. And you, I mean, I did this on a phone call recently with a client and they, they knew what to say the first time. They said, oh, I don't answer questions. So I said, well, let's role-play that. So I pretend to be a policeman. I said, oh, I noticed that you're open here. You're aware that we're under lockdown, right? There's fines for this. And they say, oh, I don't answer questions. And I said, what do you mean you don't answer questions? And they were stumped. <laughs> they didn't know what to say. Because they had their one kind of, this is my out. But without knowing how to hold position, it doesn't get you where you want to go. So holding position means simply this. We understand who we are and the direction that the conversation is going to take. And we do not let it deviate from there. Their goal, because it's a game, their goal is to get us into their realm. They want us to answer their questions or feel like we have to take their direction, but we don't. So the game, and it is a game, is to maintain, like you're on this side of the room, they're trying to get you onto that side of the room. You just stay here. And you stay here by just asking questions. That's it. So you, they might, you might say, I don't answer questions. And they'll say, what do you mean I don't, <laughs> you don't answer questions? Say, well, look, with respect, I just told you for the second time, I don't answer questions. Now, who are you and what do you want from me? Now you're directing the conversation. So they'll say, well, I told you, yeah, no, 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 I heard you, but I asked you, who are you and what are you doing here? So then they'll usually say something like, well, I'm constable such and such and I'm here from the local police station. Say, so, great. So what can I help you with today? Well, like I just said, you're under a, a lockdown. You're currently operating a business and there's like a 15,000 pound or whatever. He was in the UK. Fine for that. And I'll say, great. So is it your job? To tell me that? Is it your job to enforce it? What's the story here? So again, I'm not saying yes to anything and I'm not saying no, I'm just asking questions. So whatever they come back with, we, we set people up. We want to set them up to incriminate themselves and then we hold them on that. They'll always make a claim that is not true. They do it all the time. And so your job is once they do that is you don't let them off that. It's a, it's a technique that I've been working with for a number of years now, which is you essentially put somebody under pressure and then at the right time, you release that pressure. And I'll explain why we do that in a moment. But the way we can do that is simply with the words by holding people accountable for what they've said. And they'll always try to move away. They'll say, I don't answer your questions or I'm here to do this. And I say, yeah, well, that's okay. We can get to that. But I've asked you, now I'll ask you a second time or a third time. So let's role play that from the start. Somebody asks for identification. 
say, I need your identification. I'll say, oh, we can get to that. What have I done immediately? Have I said yes or no? And they said neither. I say, we can get to that. So I'm, I've not contracted or made any kind of agreements. We can get to that is impartial. And I'm not being belligerent now. I'm not refusing in any way. I'm not remaining silent, which is dishonorable in comments. So I'll say, we'll get to that. First of all, who are you? They'll say, well, I'm Sergeant such and such from the Southport Police Station. I'll say, great, got some evidence for that. Why would I ask for that? What, did they, what have they just made? Claim. They just made a claim. I am such and such. Say, so great. Do you have some evidence for that? Now, normally they'll say, I've just told you who I am. Here's my name tag or here's my car or whatever. I say, no, that's great. I didn't ask for that. I asked you for evidence. So they're trying to veer me away, right? They're trying to say, well, I've got this and that. And I say, yeah, but with respect, I didn't ask for that, did I? I asked you for evidence. So what are they going to do? Give you evidence straight away? Probably not. No. They're going to do something else. They have a different tactic. They'll say, well, I don't have to show you that. That's another claim. I could say, really? Well, it's my understanding that you kind of do, so do you have some evidence for that? What's your source of authority that you can walk around and not give your not identify yourself? You told me you're a police officer. You can say you're dressed as one, but I'm not under any obligation to make assumptions that that's what you are. I need to see some identification. I had a beard. If I told you I was Jesus, would you just take my word for it? <laughs> you know, or would you want to see me like walk on water or something? <laughs> We have to ask people to back up their claims. So then they'll say something like, yeah, well, if you don't do that, I'm just going to arrest you and then we'll get your name out of you one way or the other. I say, well, with respect, do whatever you like. But for the third and final time, I asked you, who are you? And give me some identification. Give me some proof. So they've just made a bit of a threat, right? They make it so that I go, oh, no, I better give them my name or give them my ID. But I know what they're doing. They're just skirting around my question and trying to get me from my side of the room to theirs. So I just don't let them. I say, well, you can do whatever you want. Now I'll just defuse that, and I'll say, but this is the third time I'm asking you. So I'm sticking to my guns, right? My original question is, who are you? That was my original question. And it's gone off two or three different tangents, but every time it does not matter what they say. They can start talking about monkeys and chimpanzees and whatever else, doesn't matter. Okay, that's great. I'm glad you're interested in that, but my question is this. I never let them take me away from my original question. Follow that? Go ahead. By saying you can do whatever you want, are you allowing them, giving them the permission to do whatever they want? No, not necessarily, because what we're doing is we're essentially just not agreeing or disagreeing. It's a, it's a neutral statement. Yeah, well, you know, because they can do whatever they want, really. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to how I've done that with police officers as well. So what we're doing is by, by building up the pressure, we're putting them in the position where they realise that, well, this, this man or this woman in front of me is not really going to go down lightly. And we can do that, let's take a, we'll get back to the police, but let's just take it as like a shopkeeper or a librarian or something like that. So the shopkeeper says to me, well, look, you can't come in here without scanning. I'll say, really, is that, is that so? I say, um, what law compels me to scan? What are you talking, scan what, by the way? Because I don't have a, you know, let's say you don't have a phone, for whatever reason. So they'll say, well, it's just a law. That's what they'll say, because they don't really know any difference. I say, oh, that's interesting, what law is that? What law compels me to do this? I caution you, I have a duty of care to let you know that if you make unjust claims against me, they can be used against you. So I'll ask you, what law compels me to do that? And they'll say, well, it's just the law. If you don't do that, you can't come in. So then what, we'll, what I'll usually do is I'll ask a question. I'll say, well, look, your job here is, do you work for the government? I'll say, no. I'll say, great. So you've, you've asked me to scan it, right? You've asked me to scan it. You have the right to do that. I appreciate that. Is it your job to ask me to scan or is it your job to enforce that I scan? They won't answer that directly. They'll say, well, that's the police or that's whatever. Say, great, so we've got agreement. That's the police job, right? You don't work for the government, you're not a police officer. You've done your job, you've asked me. Thanks very much for asking, I respect that. But I'm going to reserve my rights today. I don't consent to doing that. That's where we can go for one. If we want to take it further, they might start back chatting again. So then we'll say, well, it appears to me Remember, I'm not going to make a claim. Listen to how I say this. It appears to me that you're discriminating against me. Are you, in fact, discriminating against me for not having a phone or for reserving my rights and not consenting to scanning? Because that's what it sounds like to me. That's very different from saying, if you don't let me in, you're discriminating against me. Do you get the difference? It's quite subtle, but one's a question and one's a statement. The statement can land us in trouble because now you have to provide the evidence. 
you might be able to provide that, but again, without, I mean, if you've filmed it or if you have a witness with you, then yeah, you have a witness. However, it's best to always get into the habit of only asking the questions. So if you don't let me in today, would you not be discriminating against me? Right? Law, that, the law protects you in that way. So then what we're doing is we're not dealing with a police officer here and we don't want to be holding our position to the same strength that we would with a police officer or defence force personnel or someone to that effect, a government agent, something like that. We want to keep it relatively polite but still firm, but we still want to follow those rules of commerce where we're not making claims, we're only asking questions, and we're holding people accountable. No matter what we ask, they'll always try to not answer it, divert it to something else or ask you a question back. So the rule with this, it's actually really simple. You don't have to learn anything. The rule is, whatever they say, they may as well say blah, 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 blah. Because it doesn't matter what they say. Your response is always the same. Well, with respect, that's not what I asked. That question for the second time is this, whatever your question was. That question for the third and final time is this. If you don't give me an answer, I'll answer for you. Why can we give somebody the answer after we've asked three times? Anybody familiar with that? It's just the, yeah, it's the rule of threes in commerce. The game comes from the Bible. But essentially, that's why we're given three opportunities to respond. If you get a phone bill, you don't pay it, you'll get a, a reminder notice. Then you'll get a final notice. They can't do anything like send it to debt collection or anything like that until we've been noticed three times. Rules of three. So that works, that same system, it's not just them against us. We use the exact same thing with them. That's how I've successfully gotten money out of, uh, not supposed to say who, because of uh, confidentiality agreements, but um, pay buddy. And uh, New, oh, just service New South Wales. I don't care that everybody knows. But it's just, that's the equivalent of like TMR, Queensland Transport. Because when they make a mistake, if we send them a notice and you know they made a claim, and I say, look, you made this claim, you've actually put me out. Now, I'm going to need proof of your claim or I'm going to counterclaim you for four times the amount that you've claimed against me plus costs. Now, there's a maximum of law. A workman is worthy of his hire. That means if you're made to do anything and you're putting out your effort, you are deserve compensation for that. Nobody can ask you to work for free. It's a maximum of law. So therefore, if they're running you round and they're making you do all this and do all that and jump through hoops, is that work? Is that your time that you're putting out? It is, right? That's your time and energy. You deserve to be compensated for that. And the maximum of law, a workman is worthy of his hire, backs that up. So what we can do is we can use that and we say, look, you've given me the runaround. Now my time's worth this. You're welcome to rectify the situation and give me an apology and I'll write it off. If you don't, I'm going to be giving you a fourfold counterclaim plus cost. What do you think they do with the notice when you send them that? Bin it. They bin it. They might read it. What's that? So you send them a second notice. Or they might, on the second notice, they might write back. They say, look, we don't, we don't do any of that. We're not listening to you. We don't follow your orders. We don't do anything. If they haven't answered any of the questions that I've asked in my notice, what do I do? Send a third one. Exactly. If they have not performed to our satisfaction, you just continue with what you're doing. People, they'll try to railroad you. They do it all the time. What used to work was if you got a speeding fine or a tax or something like that, you would send in one notice of conditional acceptance and it was rectified. So a few people did that, then a few hundred people did that, then a few thousand people did that. What do you think they do when that happens? They have to, they have to turn that tap off. So then they start railroading people. Yeah, look, we don't, we don't listen to any of that sort of stuff. We're this instead. They make claims, they make wild claims. It's all about getting you to fall in a heap because you don't know who you are. That's what they're doing. And they have the right to do that, like I said earlier. It's actually not doing us favours to get the easy road all of the time. So when they give us a roadblock like that, we have to just realise what it is. It forces us to ask the question, what is going on here? What is actually being communicated? Not what's the words they've put in their notice, but what's being communicated. They're refusing, that's dishonourable in commerce. They're not answering your questions, that's assent. They're agreeing to what you're saying because they're not giving anything to the contrary. So we just go right ahead and give them the third notice. Now, in this day and age, most people are still not going to respond to a third notice. So that's why we invoice them. You were given ample time, were you not? Did I not give you a chance to respond, to give your point of view, to rebut my claims, or to, to answer my questions? Did I not give you three chances to respond? Obviously, I did, so here's your invoice. 
Then here's your reminder invoice, and here's your final invoice with reminder notice. Once you've done that, you have essentially formed an agreement and a debt has been created. That's what I've done several times with police, government agencies, financial institutions. And then I list that with a credit to statutory demand. Or I list it with NCAT or QCAT, which is a civil tribunal for a payment of a minor debt. So what happens then is that gets their attention because people don't want statutory demands on their companies. They also don't want to be spending time and money and resources when they're going to lose going to a tribunal or a magistrate's court. So then we use that to our advantage. Well, it just so happens that I'm happy to drop this when you compensate me for my time. And you can name a fee. So generally I'll sue people for a lot of money and then I'll take a small amount of settlement because my... My goal isn't really to make millions of dollars suing people and going to courts. I actually dislike courts. My goal is to just make sure that I am holding my ground and remembering who I am and I'm not letting people give me the runaround. That's essentially all I'm doing and I hold my position. It's a really key skill to learn how to hold position in any situation and this is a really key way to be able to learn how to do it is by not letting people take you off your course, whether it's verbally or with written notices. Very key. So I'll just get back to the police story because this is where the stakes raise, right? If you, I generally recommend not practicing this with police, I recommend practicing it with <laughs> shopkeepers and security guards, people who aren't gonna put you in handcuffs, right? Because they don't, they can't. You can always, you, I'll tell you this, if you engage with a policeman and you decide you, you're, like, you're over your head, you can't just go, oh, sorry mate, I'm off. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. They won't let you. But you can do that if you're trying to get into a shop and you're going, you're trying to, but yeah, but do you have, oh, I forget my thing. No, I need some evidence. No, this is going badly. <laughs> you, can, you can do that, right? You can always walk away from that situation, but you can't when you get yourself into a stoush with a police. So... Don't take that as it's always going to go badly with police either because it goes quite well. Most of the time, well, every interaction I've had with police, even when it might have gone bad for a bit, at the end they want to shake my hand or I'm like, I'm leaning on their car or I shut their door for them. Like that's common for me when I'm dealing with police on the road is I've actually got that kind of dynamic with them. But it's only because from the outset I hold my position as to they know who I am because I make it abundantly clear without making claims. It's simply by how I carry myself and the way I will ask them questions. So, the way we do that with police is we do need to build up some pressure because they're trained at this. They've heard this a lot before. Are you one of those sovereign citizens? <laughs> you ever heard that one? You're one of those common law people. And they'll say it to take the wind out of your sails. You're like, oh, I've just learned all this awesome stuff. I'm going to do this. I'm going to give them that. And they just go, you're one of those people. And you just go, oh. <laughs> it'll happen if you don't know who you are it'll happen because you'll go I think this is going to work and then it doesn't and then you're like damn it I've got no moves left Like, you know, that's what happens and they, their job is to actually draw you into that that's what they want to do and so when you're not perturbed by that then they realise who they're dealing with and it might not go your way all the time I've been put in handcuffs several times but it always ends up in my favour and I'll tell you how so your question before is if you say, well, you can do that. Oh, you can do whatever you want. The reason that I can say that is because even if they do arrest me, I'll hold it against them because I won't incriminate myself along the way and I'll set them up to be digging their own hole. So how do we do that? Well, if I'm dealing with a police officer and I'm just being polite but firm and I say, well, look, I'm going to need evidence for who you are. I'm just going to take your word for it, right? Something along that degree, those, those lines. And they go, well, I'm just going to arrest you. If you're being belligerent, you're refusing. I say, well, was I refusing? I don't recall refusing anything. I told you we can get to that. What part of that is a refusal? So I'm just asking questions again. I'm not making claims. I just say, what part of that is a refusal? I'm happy to provide you with an identification. I just need to know who you are. There and then, they pull out their handcuffs and they start to cuff me. I've never let them put my hands behind my back. I always put my hands together in front. I always say, I've got a torn labrum, which I do, but it's more that I don't want my hands behind my back, so I don't really like that. So just cuff me in front. You're not going to get into resistance. Say, I'll comply under duress, but I'm going to be charging you with false arrest, false detainment, assault, deprivation of civil liberties, and uh, whatever else I care to name at the time. I'm kidnapped. Yeah. Kidnapped, whatever. Why would I say I'll comply? Why would I say that? It's a really key word. Anyone know? 
Yeah, What's the pay a direct order, don't you? Comp well, there's there's complying and there's consent. What's the difference? Complying is something that you'll do to save your own bacon. Consent means it's voluntary. If you consent, if you don't put up any kind of, it's not fight, but if you don't voice any form of uh, disagreement with being arrested, you will consent. Because by them making the offer and you not saying, I don't consent to that or anything to that effect, you are by nature agreeing to it. You can't come back later and say, I didn't consent to that because you didn't actually do that. Can everyone hear me all right without this? Mm -hmm. uh, can, no? Better with it. Better with it? Yeah. Did you got another one? That's, that's, it. that's right. cool. So that's a key word is comply. If we comply, we are not consenting. They're two different things. So that's why I'll say something to the effect of I'll comply under duress. Now this comes down to agreements and contracts and comments. If we enter into an agreement or a contract, there are rules around that. The difference between an agreement and contract, by the way, is mostly consideration. Consideration is money of some kind. So anytime we get a driver's license, a passport, or pay anything while we sign an agreement, it's now a contract. Without consideration, which is payment, it's an agreement. So if we agree to something, then we've essentially just gone in. We've gone all in. But there are rules around that. There has to be a meeting of the minds. There has to be full disclosure. And there must be your full consent. If you enter an agreement or a contract under duress, it voids the contract. It's rules of engagement of contract law that you cannot enter under duress. That means nobody can say, you better sign that or I'm going to go after your family. Or if you don't do this, I'll do that. That voids a contract. Okay? And any standard court in the land will back that up. So when I say I'll comply under duress, I'm not agreeing to what's taking place. If I state that it's a false arrest and a false detainment, it's on them to prove otherwise. I only have to state it. And the criminal code says that they then have to prove that it was a valid arrest. Now, who knows? You don't need to know the law around it, but we can, we can bring it up. But are you under any obligation to provide your name, identify yourself to a police or to police uh, for any reason? I see one and uh, shake of the head back there. Anybody else? You know, any obligation? What is the condition by which you would have to provide your details? And it's only one. Am I under arrest? under arrest? Yeah, if you're already under arrest. That's when you have to provide your details. Now, if you're not giving your details and you're not under arrest and they want to arrest you for not giving your information when you're not under arrest, <laughs> what's going on there? Are you under any obligation to provide those details and would that not be a false arrest if they were to do that? It is, right? They're breaking the law. Unless there is cause for them to ask you, you're a witness or you're, you're implicated in a crime, then you are under no, no obligation. There has to be cause or a witness, a reason to ask. It's, uh, the case law for that is, um, well, there are actually a few, but there's uh, DPP versus uh, Hamilton, which is a Victorian High Court case, which simply says that it's, uh, it's a, it's, you can't take this away. It's, a, it's just known in the common law that we have the right to travel freely, unfettered. Nobody can just come and get in our way for no reason and ask us for our information. That's all protected by law. So if the police have a cause, if you're weaving all over the road, then hey, they've got cause, don't they? If you look like you're a danger, would they have cause to stop you and go, mate, what's the details? You've got a license, you've been drinking, you want drugs? There's cause, right? Does that make sense? You can get that. But if you're just minding your own business and there's no possible reason for them to pull you over except that it's just random, then the law's actually on our side. Now, it's not simply a case of saying, well, what about Hamilton versus DPP and... <laughs> They don't, they don't really listen to any of that sort of stuff. And they'll, sh they'll push it away on purpose to get you out of your game. So I've had several really positive interactions with police and it's gone my way. And then I've had several interactions where I've ended up in handcuffs. But because I've said I'm not, I'll comply, you'll have no resistance from me. The mistake people make is when they get to here, they freak out. Right? Fear comes up, protection comes up. And they start doing all kinds of wrong things. They become belligerent. They start swearing or yelling or saying you can't do that or resisting. All of those will work against you. So if you simply say, well, look, I'll comply. And that's why it works well for me. I say, I'll comply. You won't get any resistance. Right? But then I'm going to do this, this, and this as a result. 
And then what happens is there's the escalator. There's no need for them to put any more force on me or anything like that. And it ends up having a shit chat at the end and me telling them I'm going to sue them. And they're going, yeah, whatever. And then me suing them. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much how it works. Have you done that? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm not like a, I don't like going after people because a lot of them kind of think they know what they're doing and, and they don't. My job for me, as far as I'm concerned, is simply to help educate them so they don't make the same mistake again. Because not all of them are bad people. They might actually think that what they're doing is right. So what I'll always get an agreement out of them. I'll say, well, look, if you just buy me a guitar, if you just give me like a thousand bucks, I'll drop it all. And that's what I do. And, and rather than get them fired, which you can very well do, it's not really my intention. But sometimes we feel so disempowered, we go, I'm not going to let them get away with that. I'm going to make sure they're fired. I'm going to make sure they never work again. I'm going to make sure they pay me all this money from their indemnity insurance. Which you can do, but I just don't feel that that's as positive an outcome as just making sure that the lesson is learned. I've retained my power, they pay me a bit of money, and we go our separate ways. So you're saying that you actually sue that, that constable personally? Personally, yeah, yeah. So they then deal with it individually as opposed exactly. to the police? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So the way that this works is that anyone working in a public capacity, police, uh, anyone, anyone who owns like a salsa studio or anything, they work in the public capacity. If you work as an individual, if any of you are uh, sole traders or business owners, in order to operate in that realm, do you not have to have indemnity insurance or personal liability, liability insurance? You do, right? It's part of the game. If you're a carpenter, you have to have it. Personal trainer, you have to have it. If you work anywhere in the public, if you're a business like this, you must have indemnity insurance and liability insurance. Now, that's the Achilles heel of anyone in the public because if you go after that, well, then now there's problems because if they're an insurance risk, and they can't be covered, they can't work. So that's what we can use against people. But again, it's just to the degree that, that the balance, and things are balanced out without going, I feel so disempowered that I'm gonna ruin somebody else's life. I mean, you're welcome to do that, and some people will deserve it. They will. But I haven't had anybody that deserved that yet. So that's why I do it that way. So the pressure, what comes here is that I'll always build the pressure on somebody by holding them accountable for what they're saying and then I'll release the pressure. I'll always say something to the, to the degree of, hey look, unless you know, you just, unless we're done here, you know, something to that effect. I'll say, look, are you really claiming that you have authority over me? Are you really telling me you don't have to provide that source of authority? Are you really telling me that, well, whatever it is, how many, three or four questions I'll ask and I'll say, is that the case or are we done here? I put pressure on like three or four questions in a row and then I say, well, are we done? That's their out. Because as an individual, remember a police officer, or anybody for that matter, is a human being. And they act as such. There's no such thing as like the law and it shoots lasers at you when you break it. It needs people to back up, back things up and try to enforce it. It's people. We're always dealing with people. So how we communicate is very, very important. So if we can make somebody feel pressured... That's part of the story, but if they feel overly pressured, would they not be prone to defend, right? The ego comes up. I'm not going to have this. And that's where people find themselves on the wrong end of the stick because they've applied pressure, but they haven't let it off. They haven't, they've forgotten the human element, which is why I'll always put pressure on them and go, unless we're done. And so many times people just say, all right, on your way. It happens so often because I've diffused it. I've given them an out. If you don't give somebody an out, Imagine you're arguing with your partner or something, and then you just like you just have to be right no matter what. Like how well does that end up? If you if you have to be right, then so do they. It's very rare that somebody will just give unless you give them an out, which is unless we're done here or are we done? Is there anything else I can help you with? Right? It's the out. It's the gift. It's like here yeah, I'm not going to hold this against you anymore, and people appreciate that. So then that's why they'll drop what they're doing. So let's do a little bit of role play because uh, what I wanted to do is just set a little bit of a scene. Just to recap for those that maybe this is a lot of information in one go. We're simply following a few key rules. We don't answer questions. And if we know nothing else, we just state that. Hey, look, with respect, I don't answer questions. The amount of times I've walked off on people because I've just said that. They tried to stop me for something. I say, well, hey, actually, I don't answer questions. Thanks, though. And my energy goes. Energy is something I talk about a lot when I've got more time. But um, just as a very quick example of that, if we're engaged with somebody and we've asked them questions or we've said something to the degree of I don't answer questions, but if I stand and look somebody in the eye and say I don't answer questions, 
And I continue to look at him in the eye. What am I doing? Energetically. I'm still engaging. I'm asking them to re-engage me, aren't I? I'm asking them to. Like literally asking. So I'll say, I don't have questions. Thanks very much. And I disengage and my energy goes that way and theirs is left floundering over there. It's the difference between being successful in this and not. Because so often we're still used to that communication aspect where we're used to getting, you know, get the shake. Are we done? Have a handshake. And then, you know, we don't want to do that in this world of commerce. We simply want to direct where things are going and that's it. It might feel impolite because it goes against our indoctrination, but it's not. When it's separating public and private, we're simply being firm, but we're being respectful and we're holding ourselves. Where do we want to go? We decide, not them. Us. We decide that. So who wants to do a little role play? Who's, yep, come up. What is a common, maybe if one of the organisers wants to, thanks, wants to let us know what a common, what situation would you like to see played out? What's something common you guys get questions about all the time? Is there anything or do you want to just... Okay. All right. So uh, I'll be the um, I'll be the uh, major D or whatever I am. What we're going to do is we're just going to. There's no pressure, by the way. It's like if it, if you do this honestly and you're not sure what to say, just take your time. While you're training, it's like in martial arts, for example. If you train under high pressure all the time, you'll train bad movement. You want to be given the space to actually train in the right movement, so that then as the pressure builds up over time and you get better at it. You've got perfect movement, not faulty, this kind of stuff going on. And the same thing will happen is if we put him under too much pressure to say the right thing, it doesn't allow him the time to find himself to find that answer. So we want to give each other the, the time. And while we're going through it, I'll be checking with you guys because I want you to feel what's going on. So through our experience, I want you to feel what it's like for you to be in that situation or for you to read the engagement. And be realistic. If you don't feel like he's going to get through, say it. And then say, why? What could he be doing different? What is missing? What are you wanting to feel that he's not being provided? And likewise, if he's doing a great job, let that be known. Let us know what the experience is like for you to feel our experience. Oh, he'd definitely get in because I'm feeling this, right? That's what we want. To, that's why role play is for everybody, not just, not just the watch. All right, so here we go. Here's a QR code thing. Oh, good afternoon. Have you got a booking? Uh, no, I don't. Do you want to hear um, no, no, we can, we can get you seated, it's no problem. just need to get you scanned in there and we'll find you a seat. Is that the law? Is what, scanning? Yeah. Yeah, well, everybody's got a scan. It's just, look, we've got a lot of... We've got a lot of pressure here. We get a big fine if people don't scan when they come in. So if you can just scan, that'd be great. And I'll, uh, there's a table over there, I can get you seated. Would you be able to just show me where I'm required to sign in to, to come in here and tell you? Uh, well, look, it's just, I don't make the rules, okay? We just get emails every week that says that if we're caught letting somebody in, then we'll cop a big fine. So it's, it's nothing personal. Like, I certainly are, I'm not discriminating against you in any way. Uh, but it's just the rules that we're required to follow, so. It sort of appears to me that you're, you're saying that I need a mobile phone to sign in to come into even your Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. But, uh, are you able to show me where that's the law? Uh, no, but we've got this handout here, which is the email that we get. This outlines that it's a directive that you, it's, everyone's got to follow. It. That's, there's no like we can't make exceptions for that. My understanding is that uh, the police and, and other government agencies can enforce it. But are you a police officer or? Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no I'm not a police officer. <laughs> you appear to be enforcing this, and you know, I'm, I'm a happy patron. I want to find ED, and uh, you're enforcing this, which you claim is the law. To come and eat in your premises. All right, pause there. How are we feeling? How's this standing? Nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But is is anybody feeling under pressure? Like, if you're me, are you feeling a bit of pressure now? Because yeah. I am. Yeah. Are you feeling it as well? Yeah. So so far, this is amazing. This is. I really think this is great. What what I'm going to look for now? I mean, obviously we haven't finished. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But what I'm looking for is a way for you and I to not be at the moment. You're putting me under a lot of pressure, and I'm really feeling. It. So what I want to feel is that, again, we're just two human beings from the same community. And while you're making it very clear, has he done a good job of making it yeah. clear yeah. about what his position is and what my position is? Yeah. Yeah. Feel that? I've, I've, I'm fine 100%. So what I need to feel is that so that you don't not make me feel so small and I'm crumbling and I need to defend somehow is to bring it back around to some way if we can. So, yeah, look, no, I'm definitely not a police officer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, sir, it's, well, obviously uh, it is not my job to enforce it. You're absolutely right. 
Um, but you, can you see I'm in a bit of a difficult situation here? I really appreciate it, and, and I understand that the, the government and law enforcement put businesses like your own in this position. Uh, but I'd really like to eat here, and uh, I, I'm not willing to, to sign in, or, or I don't have the device to be able to sign into this today. Okay. And I understand that it's not the law. So is there a way that we can hear, this isn't role play right now, is there a way that we can come to some kind of, because quite often there's going to have to be some give. Yeah. There's always some kind of negotiation going on. So is there some way we can negotiate this? I see you've got no phone. That's fine. You know, I can't make you carry a phone. So uh, what can we do here? Well, I'm not going to tell them that I'm going to use a false name, but I'm happy to yeah. sign in. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Would you have any other options for me to come into your premises today? That's great. So that's an open-ended question. Ask you. If you didn't hear it, he said, are there any other options for me to come into the premise today? Then he's not refusing now. So remember if you just say, I don't want to do that, that's a refusal, isn't it? Yeah. That's saying no. Remember in commerce, we've got four ways we can answer. This should be most of you familiar with this. We've got a full acceptance, which is just like yes or no. Full acceptance. Conditional acceptance, I can do that based on these conditions. They're honourable. Dishonourable is no refusal or arguing. That's dishonourable in commerce, and so is silence. That's also dishonourable. So here we're at, we're, we're almost over the line. There's two ways that I can see this going. One is a slight negotiation, and the other is that slight bit of pressure. It's like, look, if you were to discriminate against me, I'm not saying you are, but if you were to discriminate against me, um, you know, that that's probably uh, not going to look good, is it? Know, something to that degree, depending on who you're talking to. The way I would normally bring that across is I'll say, well, look, the thing is, is if you were to tell me that I can't come in based on the fact that I don't have anything to scan, um, wouldn't that constitute discrimination? Yeah. And I know that you're just doing your job, so I respect that totally. But the thing is that I need to reserve my rights. You understand that, right? Like, I don't want to be discriminated against as you would. That's a good one. So then, then now, now we're kind of like, we're like teaming up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. You see how that's working? Yeah. So then it's a lot more likely that as a human being, I'm like, man, this guy's cool. I like him. And I'll just go, just come in and just don't tell anyone or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast but, free hotel is, really, is real simple for me. So anywhere that's a tavern or a pub or something to that effect, an RSL, they're going to be the hardest. Mm. They're literally going to tell you to get out. We, we don't want your patronage anyway. Yeah. So can we switch that? Yeah, can course, you be yeah. that? Can you be that? So okay. you'd be really difficult and then... I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to get in, all right? So this is part of kicking your battles. We always need to know what we want to achieve before we enter uh, any, any situation. We want to know what we want to achieve, because without a plan, we're kind of just flailing around, playing it by ear. That's not necessarily always bad. But if I'm going into somewhere like this, I'm pretty much just going to... I kind of know that they're going to make it super difficult. So what I'm going to do, I'm telling you this in advance because I want you to pick up on what I'm doing... I want you to pick up where I'm getting, setting him up to incriminate himself. That's my goal here, just for the purpose of learning. So, uh, hey. Yeah, so have you got a booking tonight? Uh, no, no, booking, but I just wanted to come in and grab a meal. Uh, yeah, you're able to come in, but if you could please could sign into the QR code first before you enter. A scan, a scan, what, sorry? Uh, it's a government thing, I'm not too sure if you're aware of it, but uh, if you haven't no, been in not. Queensland for a while, it's the Queensland app, you need to sign into every premises before you come in to eat. Right, okay. So, is that all? Uh, so are you here by yourself tonight, or are you here with friends? This, what, is that a law? The, uh, this thing here, is that, am I compelled by in some way to actually scan in here? As, as far as we're like, aware, it's the law, because we're being given fines if, if people aren't signed, so we're here to, to police it, to stop right, people okay. coming in unless they sign in. Okay, cool. So I can see it's your job to inform me about this, right? Is it your job to enforce it as well? Uh, unfortunately, my terms of employment is I need to do this so before anybody comes in. And if I get caught not doing it to you, yeah. I could lose my job. Right, yeah. Well, we certainly wouldn't want that. I don't want to put you in a, a sticky situation. I've got five kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the thing is, the thing is, is that I, I do appreciate that, okay? But the thing is, is it's my understanding that if you were to refuse me entry based on something like this, it would actually constitute discrimination. So that would actually mean that my understanding is you would be liable for fines or even jail time, either you or the company. So and I wouldn't want that because obviously you're a good guy just looking after your kids. So what I'm going to suggest is, or ask you, is there some other way that we can, uh, we can do this? Because I want to be a patron of your business. wouldn't be here to support you if I didn't like it. You know, so I'd rather just obviously be friends in the same community. So is there some other way that we can arrange for me to have a meal? I think 
the only option I can do is get my manager and uh, if I bring him over here, then maybe you can talk to him. Yeah, so pause there. That's what's going to... Managers basically are always going to be called. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the first step. Because the, pay, the, the guy working here isn't going to want to take that. No. So let's just assume we've had the exact same conversation again and now we're at the point where you're saying... I say, look, is there is there some kind of... Well, actually, we wouldn't have used that. I'm going to try to do this a lot more simply than I would normally do it. So I'll just say, uh, yeah, look, hey, look, I'd love to eat here, okay? But... Um, it's my understanding that, that uh, I have the right to reserve my privacy, right? And that if you were to tell me that I can't come in based on a scanning or not, then that would constitute discrimination. And so my position is that uh, that's obviously not something that I'm willing to accept because I, I do choose to reserve my rights. It's not something that I consent to. Um, but at the same time, I respect the fact that you've got a business to run and, and you don't want to be put in any kind of, you know, put up against the wall. So my understanding as well, though, is if you were to discriminate against me, that could look quite bad on business. That could be at least a $5,000 fine plus and jail time. So that's not something I would want for you. What, what would, do they say, what, what happens if right there he says, are you threatening me? Because I've had yep, this. Like, that's yeah. why I'm bringing it up. Oh, yeah, cool, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to put a little bit of pressure on so you might get a bit defensive. Yeah. Normally, if, in, in the real world, I wouldn't use that, okay? I'm just trying to get it to be a bit defensive at the moment. So, yeah, so well, it's fine. Unfortunately, uh, I understand what you're saying, but uh, the rules are you can't come in unless you've signed in, so... Okay, great. So, it appears that you're discriminating against me right now. So, as somebody working in a public capacity, I'm going to need to ask you for your name, okay? Because I will be putting in a formal complaint. Again, nothing personal. I'd love to support your business, but at the same time, uh, this, this isn't fair treatment for me. So, what was your, what was your name? I'm not open to answer that, sorry. Are you refusing to answer that? No, no. Uh, so it sounds like you're refusing to answer You're refusing to sign the QR code. Did I refuse or was I like asking questions? Uh, I don't remember refusing. I recall you refused to sign in. Yeah? Uh, well, you have. You have some evidence for that? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's, look, I'm not, I don't want to cause a fuss here. Like, I, honestly, I don't want to cause a fuss. It just sounds like you made a really bold claim, so that's why I asked for evidence. Now, the fact is, is that it seems that you're discriminating against me, okay? So that's why I'm going to need your name. You work in a public capacity, do you not? You're the provider here of this business? I'm the manager Great. of this business. Great, so I'm going to need your name because if you were going to refuse, it would mean that you're actually personating this position. That's an offence as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to need your first name and your last name. What would you name? We have an option here to sign in if you like, if you're not willing to use a QR code. But um, unfortunately, there's no other options to come into our premises. Okay, I think we've been past that. I've asked you for your name, so for the second time now, what was your name? My name's John Smith. Yeah, thanks, John. So, look, what I'm going to do, John, is I'm going to put in a formal complaint. Again, it's nothing against you. I understand you're in a difficult position here. But I am going to be putting in a formal complaint, okay? And then um, there's going to be action taken from there. At the moment, it's basically going to be a discrimination case, okay? So now, all right, so let's just pause there. Notice how he was... You did a great job, by the way. Yeah. 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 Thank you. yeah, well, he did a great job of not answering my questions, right? I asked him for his name, and he took it to me, oh, well, you're refusing, sir, right? That was brilliant, because that's what will happen. And so what I had to do was I say, well, look, that's great. That may or may not be true, but the thing is I asked you for your name, so for the second time I'm going So when you get asked like that, it puts you under a bit more pressure, right? Yeah. You kind of will cop up your name. It's That's what police do to you, right? They do that. People in the public do that. They make you feel uncomfortable, so the second or third time they ask, you're like, I'm pinned. My name's such and such. But you never have to give it. So what I was doing was just putting some pressure on, because he was also putting it on me, and did a great job. I don't know if you managed anywhere before, because that was... No, like, but I've been... Yeah, it's happened a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's what that looks like. So at the moment, remember, I wasn't going to get through. We were, we were going to do the scenario where it wasn't a happy ending. However, what I've done is got him to incriminate himself to the point where he's admitted he's refusing the entry and he's discriminating and he's given me his name. That's all I need to be able to put in a formal complaint. Now, the reality is, do we want to do that? That's open to you. I'm not sure that I really want to do that to people. I like to let it be known, perhaps. Maybe I'll put in a, a formal complaint without going for that. I'm going to also charge you for this, you know? It's like we've really got to pick our battles here because we're not really on opposing sides. It might seem like we are, but we're really, you know, we at the, the way the world's going, we want as many people on our side as possible. We really want to get people offside. So, um, all right. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for that. So, um, 
the cafeteria even after I'd been seated. So I'd asked if I could go and just manually sign in. Yes. So, you know, straight away they said, have you signed in? I said, oh, no, I haven't. Can I manually sign in, please? So yeah. they got me to manually sign in. But that was the manager. When the manager found out about me, and I was with the mind at the time, he come and ask us to leave, even though we had coffees and everything like right. that. He literally got us taken to eight cups and asked us to pour our coffees in there and we had to leave. So I had a great discussion with him. I didn't take it that way. He said, mm. look, I'm, I'm not a resident here. I'm not a permanent citizen. I'm from Germany. I've got uh, social staff I've got to look after. Rah, rah. He said, see these signs. I got um, a $1,300 fine the other day, or $13,000, I can't remember actually, mm. for not displaying these signs. I simply can't have you here, you need to leave, you need to leave now. Mm -hmm. And um, I just said, well look, I'll do. I'll stand up for you, I'm in the same position as you, I've got a business, I've got staff, yeah. and uh, so I'll go and stand up for you, but I appreciate, you know, what you're doing, but I, you know, I think you couldn't let us have yeah, yeah, coffees. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but he was that scared, that scared. So yeah, I don't want to, you know, like, and I don't want to, because he's had them come around to his restaurant, uh, to his cafe, mm -hmm. without reason. And of course, there's people knocking on them. It's, you know, yeah. they're just in fear. Yep. So, um, but leaving the table, <laughs> I mean, we've already started there. I mean, we're yeah, pouring yeah. Yeah, cups. Yeah, it's coffee. a bit excessive. So, if just to recap, um, she's at a, a cafe. The manager asked them had they signed in. She did a, a manual sign in. Also, the, the uh, shopkeeper. Then the manager came and said that you can't do that yeah. and asked them to leave and poured out their drinks and then told them they had to get out because they recently received the fine and they was really scared about any other action coming. So, uh, is the kind of with next spread? Yeah. <laughs> so we need to just again, we need to determine what is the outcome we want to have here. Is this one of those situations where we go, well, that's a lost cause, and I'm just going to find a different cafe, mm. right? That's that's kind of like the path of least resistance. Is not to argue, realize that they're in a difficult position. It's nothing personal. There's somebody who's just defending themselves and their livelihood. We can understand that people get a bit weird when they're in that position, right? So we can just say, well, look, all right, I hear what you're saying. I don't agree with it. Just say, no, I think you're doing the wrong thing. However, I respect that. See you later. And you can walk out. So the question then becomes, are you okay with that? At what level do we start wanting to assert our rights? So some of us here are happy saying, well, I'm not going to scan, not refusing. So like, I don't have the ability. I'm happy to sign in manually. Right? Some of us are happy to do that. Other people are going to say, no, that's not good enough. Anyway, either because that whole thing is what I'm against. The signing in anywhere in any way, even if I do put a fake name, it's the fact that we're towing this line. And other people are like, no, I'm not doing that. There is no right or wrong answer though, and it's where you're at. Don't let other people's idea of what's right and wrong affect the way you play. Because you, you're welcome to walk out and say, thanks, I think you're doing the wrong thing, but see you later, no worries. You're welcome to go and put a fake name in. You're also welcome to just assert your rights completely and say this whole thing's a sham and we need to stop this now, otherwise the new world order's going to roll, over, roll in and have its party. So where you're at is where you're at. Please don't let other people make you think that you've got to do things a different way. So in this situation, if you really wanted to do... One second. If you did want to really assert this, you would need to uh, essentially ask for... You need to ask for a few things, but you essentially just get to incriminate yourself really quickly. Now, you are with somebody. If you're with somebody, they're a witness, right? So, filming it and having a witness, is that the same thing or not? It is. Yeah, a video is a second witness. Another individual is a second witness. If they sign an affidavit stating what happened, then that is, that's, a, that's a legal document. That stands in court, especially if it's not rebutted. That's, a, that's part of law. An unrebutted affidavit stands as the truth in court. So having a witness is a, is, a, is a good thing. So what you would do in that situation, if you wanted to push it, you say, well, look, I feel as though I'm being treated very, very unfairly. I believe I've done everything that I'm required to do, and I think that you're discriminated against me right now. That's what I feel. You, know, you, you can even say, I, you are discriminated against me. In this case, you could say that. Because you have complied with everything so far. You signed in manually, right? That you still signed in. So you say, I believe... I always use words like believe, it's my understanding. Then I'm not making claims, even if I make a claim. If I say, I've, I've complied, that's a statement. But if I say, I believe I've complied, is that a statement or not? No. It's not. <coughs> belief or, or a, an understanding is not, a, is not a claim. So I just say, look, I believe I've complied. I believe I've done anything I'm required to do. You know, if you're going to eject me now, I can only take that as discrimination. 
and I'm going to need your name right now. I'm not giving you my name, get out of my store. Well, look, with respect, I'll leave because I'll comply, I don't want any trouble. You're threatening me, at, which is assault, by the way. That's assault. Threatening, verbally threatening, or standing over somebody, it's assault. So you say, well, now, now you're assaulting me, and if you don't give me your name, you're also obstructing me. So when I leave here, I'm going to find out what your name is because that's not hard to do. I just have to find out what the, your name is by looking up the business name or calling fair trading or anything like that. And then you can have a lawsuit on your hands. So if you notice them on the spot, that's part of the job done. Again, you don't need to be nasty. You just need to state it. Look, I'm going to leave. I'll comply. I don't want any trouble. But at the moment, I feel very threatened. That's assault. I feel that I'm being discriminated against, that's another crime, I'm going to report that. The fact that you're not giving me a name means that I'm going to have to report that as well. Okay? You'll be hearing from me, but see you later. And then you walk out. Because that's step one, you've set the scene, and from there you, you file notices on people, and that's how you can... Um, you can get things turned around real quick too, because normally you might say, they might turn around and, and go, well, uh, just, yeah, I did the wrong thing, and then it can be a, a case of allowing them to apologize. And then you say, well, let me come in for a free meal. You apologize, no harm, no foul. So there's a couple of things we'll get, get to, but you had a question there, gentlemen, there? It is happening. And what, what's, what you have and what you've experienced, it's already happening. There's a massive uh, move on for all of the people who own businesses now. Yep. They've all been called on, the police have even come mm. to do this, and this is happening yep. majorly. So we're mm. gonna receive this kind of treatment like you did, get out, because they're so afraid. Yep, they are. It's already uh, five or six, at least five or six places I've been this week. Get out. We're too scared. Yep. We've been told. They visited us already three times this week. We've been having cops in here. So they already know what's so, going We need to be ready. So what cures that is education, right? Education is a cure for unnecessary fear. Yep. They think that, but that's just because they're being given an offer. In commerce, they've been given an offer. They haven't asked a proof of claim or anything. They haven't provided it. They haven't negotiated Sharon here, who I'm going to invite up soon, is going to let people know about some business essentials packs that she's been putting together with the help of other people who are in the common law world. And these are what we can hand out to businesses, which we've done around our town. Most people are familiar with like Mullumbimby kind of area down south where we're from. Uh, very much a, uh, you know, people don't vaccinate much around there. People kind of <coughs> like to kick up a stink if they feel that they're being un treated unfairly. And we have successfully gone around to several businesses who put things up saying, well, we're not even going to ask you if you why you're wearing a mask. If you're not wearing one, we'll assume you've got an exemption. Or they'll just have something to the effect of, yeah, there's this QR code thing, I'm not going to mention it, come on in. Because they've been educated to the point where they know that's a false threat. Or that they're only going to incriminate themselves if they start accepting fines from... And the fact is, every single one of those COVID-related charges, take it to court, all of them gone. Not one of them is stuck. So... By being educated, we can uh, take away that fear from people. And so, trying to let you know what we're doing with that, because that's something that you might want to be proactive in your community. Get a few of these together, get out there and, and talk to people. Not when it's like you're trying to get into the premise, when there's no pressure. Just walk in, hey, by the way, I'm just doing a community service here. I want to let everybody know that here there's been a lot of threats to businesses. I'm a business owner myself. Well, don't lie, but you know, like, just have it, whatever the conversation is. And did you know this? I was really scared, but what I found out is that these are the actual laws and the actual rules. And I found this out. It gave me a big brush of fresh air. I'd like to share it with you, something to that effect, right? And then you can leave it with them and go. You're not even trying to eat there that day or enter the store that day. And that plants the seed. And other businesses then are like, hey, we're not doing this. And then the others go, yeah, well, we're not doing that either. Because who really wants to do that? As a business owner, who wants to be like, get out of my store? Who wants? No, but they don't want to do it. So if we educate and we come to them as part of the same community, not us against you, you against us, we can make really strong inroads to that. Yeah. So, um, but Sharon will, will uh, tell us about that as well. Um, do you have a question? Just with the um, assault and obstruction and the stuff that you're talking about before, is there a difference in a shopkeeper and a business owner? Because obviously you can't have that conversation. Yeah. Yep, it is. That's, that goes for anybody doing that at any time. That's what our like our rights are about. Is um, one second, yeah. Is that? Yeah, sorry. So for those that didn't hear, the question is whether it's a shopkeeper or a police officer, can the same charges be laid if they stand over you? Is that still assault? It's the same for anybody, because what you're dealing with again is a name. 
Forget police officer. Forget like government official or anything. It's a name. Same as you. They're not after your flesh and blood. They're after your name. And then when you join to the name, or you become surety for the name, then that's when your sweat and blood provides the labour to pay for that, or your flesh and blood gets put in a jail cell for the name. So we, it's the exact same system, like when you get three phone bill notices, that's what we use against them. We notice them, we invoice them, we give them three. And then we hold, we, we put in, uh, you know, a demand for payment of debt. It's the same thing. So when somebody is acting out like that against us, then we use their name. And we just go after their name. It doesn't matter who they are. They can be anybody. Like literally anyone. Is that? Yep. Uh, you can, so the question is if you've gone to get like a hair appointment or something and then uh, you booked online so would you give false details at the beginning uh, I generally don't wouldn't do that because just because you booked it under your name what's to say I didn't book it for you you know like I'm your, bro- I'm your brother or something oh I'm going to get my sister a hair appointment it doesn't she didn't agree to terms and conditions necessarily because somebody might say that well you booked it you booked it right what would you say it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you wouldn't even have to say, I don't think I did. You just say, well, do you have some evidence that I did? Yeah, yeah. Right? Because that, that's all you need to do. It's that they're making claims, ask for the proof of the claim. It's, it's a very simple formula. Yep. So I've got a question. So, I, when the whole mask thing was happening here in Queensland, I went to JB Hi Fi, it had a big sign at the door, and it said, We refuse, can't come in without a mask on. Mm-hmm. I walked in, lady said, oh, you need a mask? And said, thank you, I'm exempt. I just smiled and walked in. It was all good. A few minutes later, someone came up to me and said, excuse me, you need to wear a mask, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, actually, no, I don't. I've got an exemption. He said, can you show me? I said, no, I don't have to. And he said, uh, I'll get the manager. So he got the manager and then the manager came over and he said, you need to wear a mask. I said, no, I don't. I've got an exemption. He said, can you prove it? I said, no, blah, blah. I went down that whole scenario. I pulled out my phone. I showed him the law. I said, it's discrimination. All that sort of stuff and he said we can actually ask you to leave the store i said no you can't he said yes we can it's private property he says on a private property we can ask you to leave the store i said oh so you actually discriminating against me because i'm not wearing masks and you're refusing me to shop into your store and he said um and he thought about it for a minute he goes uh well this is private property and we can allow people in as we like i understand where you are blah 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 we went backwards and forwards and he said how about uh, he said well I'll tell you what you can shop in the store as long as one of my staff um follows you wherever you go and goes with you. So, no, true story. So, it follows you because other people in this store may feel threatened by you. And um, it was really interesting because both these guys are much taller than me. And I said, well, I feel really threatened now. Number one, I can't see your face because you're behind a mask. I don't know who you are, I can't identify you. I said, but I feel under threat. So I feel like I'm under threat in your store, even though I'm a customer, I've been a customer for 20 years. Are you asking me to leave? He said, no, but we will actually, you know, we will, escort you around the store just so other people don't feel threatened. I said, you know what? It's too much trouble here today. I'm going to leave. I'm going to wish you a good day. Um, but just know in the future when people come in like myself that you have a, a right, you know, your obligation to let them in. And he's like, okay, thanks. And then I left. And that was it. And it was easier for me to leave. And I gave him all the information at the time. And it was a yeah. bit of a, you know, a bit of a to and fro, but we were both very friendly. Yeah. Um, but he said, and this is the key thing, he said, Private property, we have the right to refuse entry to you. Yeah, is he I'm right? So, yeah, did everybody, does anybody need a, a summary of that? Did you all hear? Yeah. All heard? Okay, great. Which was, and by the way, the way you held position was really good. Mm. It was actually a really, really good interaction. So, the question really is if somebody says, I have, it's my private property, I have the right to refuse, is that true? No. No, it is actually. But it's under conditions. There's conditions for that. If somebody's looking menacing, or they peed their pants and they're carrying a knife or something, he absolutely has the right to refuse entry onto his private property. But the reason he didn't want to push it is because you brought up discrimination, which it would be. It's not discriminating when it's your private business and you actually do have a a certain element of responsibility to make sure that the other customers are not feeling threatened. You actually do have that. That's a duty of care to provide. And so if somebody does appear menacing, you, you actually have to, to have a word with them first. You have to say, look, dude, you're wearing a black trench coat. 
you got like lube in your hand. It's like, it's like I, I don't, I don't really see what this is about. Like, can you explain to me why you're wearing this outfit or the way you, you seem shady? I don't want to make accusations against you, but I just need to look after my customers. And you, you have the right to do that. If they can, oh mate, I'm just fancy dress. That's all it is. And he, and he appears coherent or whatever. Then yeah, you let him into the store. But if he's all, well, I won't try to. Act it out. But if he's, if he's like. You can just sense that he's up to no good, then absolutely you have a right to refuse entry because it's your private business. However, the fact that you are speaking well, you're dressed well, you don't smell like you know you just come from the zoo, it's like then he does not have the right to refuse because then it's purely discrimination because you're not a threat. Like, and that's why, why he belligerent. And that's why he backed down and then he offered to have someone exactly. follow me around the store. So in this situation... In this situation, I'm very much of the uh, position where I don't let people push me around or anything like that. <laughs> but I personally would have actually let them walk, walk you around. It's definitely not a wrong thing to say, no, I'm standing my ground, I think I've been treated unfairly, I'm going to leave. Because some people are doing that. Well, I'm not going to be a patron of your business anymore. You know what a lot of people say? I don't care. There's hundreds more. You're like, you're a minority. That's what they say. So we, it's kind of not really working in our favour to do that unless we have strength in numbers where this whole room goes to go into a movie theatre or a restaurant and we've all got bookings and they say, well, we're, we're going to discriminate. They say, oh yeah, well, we're going to take our business elsewhere. And then they've got an empty restaurant or movie theatre for that night. That would work, but only with numbers. Okay, so in this instance, I would say, look, I respect that because I can see the position you're in. And, and it's true. Customers do walk around like shooting daggers out of their eyes if they see somebody else wearing a mask because they're under the false impression that they are a threat. So you can't argue somebody's experience, right? So if somebody says, I feel threatened because you're not wearing a mask, do they have a right to say that? Yeah. They actually do. Even though it's like cuckoo, they actually, that, you can't argue their experience because they do feel threatened. Okay, so we have to, one sec, we have to um, keep that in mind. And the only way around that, as I say, is education. But the way that I do this, and this is, we actually had in our last workshop a woman who uh, gave a similar story. When I've been around people with masks, what I do with myself is because I'm so comfortable in myself that I don't feel that they're a threat to me. I don't feel that they're dumb. I don't feel anything. And I make sure that with what I carry, they, I welcome them around me. And with my eyes, I, may, I, I catch them. And my eyes don't have judgment in them. So straight away, their defences are down. And there's something about them that goes, there's something about this guy that I don't feel fear around him. He feels calm. Why? Something unconscious in them that's of the body. The body has its own mind. The body reads my body and it says, this is okay. They don't feel that fear. And then the interaction seems to be fine. A lady we had at our last workshop said that, uh, she had an interaction with, uh, with somebody, a lady who was following her around, abusing her. But she kept her calmness and, and stood her ground and explained what was going on. And then other customers, uh, yeah, somebody let her in front to get her groceries and then they took off their mask. And someone at the cash register took off their mask and two more people took off their masks. Mm -hmm. Because that spread, mm -hmm. right? It, can, it's, it only takes one person in, in a whole room. If everybody's freaking out, the, the floor rumbles for a second. And one person's just sitting there, just resonant and calm. Everyone's like, what the hell? She and they must just... have been pretty profound what she said, though. Well, it was just really just stating, stating general common sense stuff. And sometimes it doesn't have to be profound. It's not the words. It's, it's the, the resonance in the words. So that's the, the key distinction that I like to pass off to people is the fact that when you become that for yourself, it's like the, the words become less of an issue. Oh, I forgot the right line. It's like the analogy I always use, and everybody in the room will relate, is that if, if you're a woman, or if you're a guy, and you've gone and you try to learn to pick up lines because you're really bad with women, you don't know how to talk to women, you can study all the Casanova's greatest hits or whatever, <laughs> and go up and say that you, you can walk up to a woman, if you're not the right guy, it doesn't matter what you say, she's not interested. You all have that experience of being spoken to by a guy that's not the right guy. Conversely, the right guy with the right energy could say the dumbest thing in the world or say nothing at all and she'll be interested in it. You don't know that, right? You've had the experience of that happening to yourselves on either end. And it's the same with the law. Yes, the words are important, but what you, what you carry through the words, your essence of being, that is more important. And we can change a whole room simply by who we are, not necessarily having to lecture somebody on why they're an idiot, 
for thinking that you're a danger to them for wearing a mask because it won't compute. It doesn't matter what you say in that way, it won't compute. You have to have the calmness behind it. So, uh, yeah, I had a couple of, yep, you were first. Yeah, great. So somebody in Palm Beach hairdresser is not allowing vaccinated people in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and it will. And this is the thing is that there's no time in the world anymore to, to hide your light under a bushel, to hide your truth. This is a time in the world where what we're seeing in the world is simply a representation of the shifts that are happening. It's always been happening, it just wears a different mask. It's been like SARS, or it's been like uh, AIDS, or it's been this. Now it's just wearing the coronavirus mask. It's just a representation of the energetic changes in the world, and it's tumultuous. We see, we see things happening, events in the world that seem tumultuous, but they're just the external representation. And what's going on with the earth is also going on inside of us. And it's not a time to hide truth, and that's why you're all here. It's the time to actually make that known because what happens instead of being in this grey area where you're like trying to please everyone, it's, it's, there's no time for that anymore. And so when you do make a stand like this, you'll be booked out because it's, it's putting a line in the sand. And it's not putting anyone down either. You're not trying to bring yourself up by putting others down. You're just simply living your truth. And that's really the big lesson about this whole thing we're seeing in the world is getting people to go, well, who am I? But before that, you might not have cared. Oh, it's just easy to go to work, I can go to the beach, I can just go to a restaurant here, go play footy there. Right? There was no real impetus for you to actually have to get to know who you are. What's really important to you in your life? What are your core values? That's what this has done for us. Like, who here even heard of equity or common law or whatever a year ago? Most of you probably hadn't. And now you've got an opportunity to find out, not about your rights necessarily, but who you are. What, what is the being behind those rights? That's what it's all about. So everything's really leading us to that. So I do recommend that if you are in that position, maybe you're new to this, to not feel that you have to hide that from friends, from family, for fear of being ostracized. Because what you'll find is instead of having a bunch of mediocre friends, you'll have a tribe that's like super tight because you're all living the same kind of resonance and truth. And that's so powerful. And that's really why we're here. We get taken away from that indoctrinated to fit in these boxes where they're not, it's not us. So now we're given the chance to break those boxes down and become who we truly are. So for me, that's why one of the reasons I don't feel apprehension or fear or anything around what's happening in the world, I see it as a big favour for all of us and I feel like I'm benefiting from it personally. Like a year ago, nobody knew who I was until I put out that video on viruses, which was literally I was making fun of my friends. I didn't think anyone was going to see that video. And so since then, you know, now a lot of people know who I am and what I stand for and it's done me a world of good as well. So, and... You know, other people say, well, how you're brave to put yourself out there like that, to, to tell people the truth about that, because people go missing for that sort of stuff, or you'll get ostracized, or people will have a go at you on the internet, and I'm like, yes, but that doesn't matter to me. And it also wasn't brave, because all I was doing was speaking what I knew to be true. It wasn't a risk at all. It was actually easy. And so that's the invitation to everybody at this point in time in the world, is to just be who you are. Don't be afraid to speak the truth. Don't feel you need to put others down or make them wrong in the process, but just be who you are. And people respond. You know, people respect that. When they know where you stand, they may not like it, but they will respect it in one way or another. Tom, right. I'm, I'm really concerned about the health at the moment. Like, for instance, I went to a, for an x-ray the other day and um, straight away they're saying QR code, QR code, and then I instantly said, oh, look, if you've got the manual, I'll, I'll write that out. Um, and elderly people lining up trying to get their QR cards done. And then one gentleman came and said, no, no, I won't be doing that. And he went through his business. And she said, well, you will be in, um, you will be in June when it all stops. And so like, how are we going to get to the health, you know, and to health? Like, so I went to get the results of the doctor. And so I went to my doctor and he, the lady comes straight up to me with the temperature, put it on my head. Who's even doing that now? So I just said, oh, hey, you know, do you want to ask me? Yeah. And she's and she's just said, we well, have to have it. You don't go in. I said, well, you can just take it from my wrist. And really, it's not even about that for me. It's just about what's behind it. So, um, so she said, no, no, doctor won't see you with your wrist because it's inaccurate reading. And I said, are you telling me I can't get my X-ray results today? I said, look, that's fine. Can you please just email them to me? She instantly hated me. I was great when I first got in. She instantly hated me. Yeah. But I need to go out there with, um, you know, 
know, I can never go out there to put them out or anything like that. Yeah. And so she, she rang the doctor. Doctor said he's coming out. The doctor's coming out. He came out. He must have been doing something because he was in the apron, gloves, mask. <laughs> and I looked at him like that and he stood up and went, you know, stay there, young lady. <laughs> so he said, and he said, now tell me what this is all about. And I said, oh, look, no, look, look, there's no point. You don't have time. I don't have time. You're not going to agree with me. I'm not going to agree with you. Let's just get, can I come into your office and would you like to give me the results here? Or you can ha you can email them to me. Mm -hmm. But now I don't have, I can't go to my doctors. I mean, where do, where do we go with that? Yeah, okay. Where do we go Good question. With yeah. Well, first of all. <laughs> I can answer that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. Oh, well, all through this mask wearing thing, every time I went somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you want to come up here? You know you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. My name is Amelia. I'm not a troublemaker, but I don't <laughs> wear a mask. So everywhere I've been, you, know, you need to wear a mask. I go, I can't wear a mask because I tend to pass out. Good. Don't wear a mask. Story. Yeah. No so she's she's right. Well, first of all, by the way, any story in a New Zealand accent is better than a story in any other accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I'm constantly worried they'll send me home too. So yeah, right. I think they'll send me home before a murder or just believing in what I believe in. So yeah. That's a constant worry too, isn't it? Well, yeah. Well, first of all, you're exactly right. And this is how, if anybody wants to go and get an exemption from a GP, if you say something to the effect of. Exactly. Anxiety. Exactly. Anxiety, panic attacks. I was claustrophobic as a kid. I tried to wear a mask to go into the store to do the right thing. If you if you're against the system, right, there's a, a rift there straight away. But if you make it seem as though you're on their side, they don't have the same oh, they're one of these troublemakers, one of these conspiracy theorist people. They won't it won't trigger that in their mind. So I tried to do the right thing. I tried to put on a mask when I went into a store, but within a minute I ran out. I was sitting on the footpath hyperventilating, I had anxiety, I thought I was going to pass out. It took me five minutes to catch my breath. And it brought back memories of when I was locked in the closet by my big brother. <laughs> when I was five. Right? Now they're not going to argue with that. If they, if they uh, were to refuse a mask exemption, for example, in that situation, they are being negligent in that they never do it. And same with anybody on the street too. You don't have to go and get an exemption. But if you say something like that and they try to say, no, you still have to, oh, there's a lawsuit against them straight away with a, with a standard lawyer as well, not even in the private. So, yep. I actually had a doctor refuse on those grounds. I really? then ran back and made a complaint about that doctor yeah. in particular because he was actually discriminating against me and another then. They're like, that's not the right doctor. And I said, I completely agree. And then they were so nice to me. Yeah. I actually complained to the man. Good, yeah, you've got to. You'll have to, yeah, if they do that, the, what she said, if you didn't hear, is that she did that exact same uh, kind of situation with a doctor and they refused it. So she put in a complaint about that doctor and then it was rectified. You always, you're going to have to, thanks. You're going to have to uh, always stand your ground uh, with things like that. We've only got, I'll take one more question, yeah. Lung restriction is a really good one too, which can be pain. Yeah, any kind of, yeah. Pain, <laughs> lung restrictions, anything like that, breathing difficulties, absolutely, asthma, anything like that. Uh, Sharon, do you just want to come up for here for a second? This is Sharon from down our way as well. Uh, Sharon's just going to let you know quickly about the um, business essentials packs that she's putting together and the um, contact details for how to get involved if you want to, because I do recommend that. It is a community effort, and if we can do this and get it out to business owners, then we'll have less of an issue. Um, yeah. Okay, um, down in the Northern Rivers and supported by Tom, we've been running some um, communication groups, I suppose, about rights as well. So we're educating ourselves and we've also put together some business essential packs, which are... Just hold a bit closer. Oh, can you hear me? Now we Okay, all right. So we put these business essential packs. So basically, we know because of the, the last uh, mask mandates, and you guys sound like you're a bit of pressure under here. Um, the psychology of what's going on. So we're sprinkling seeds. We're not going in gung ho, um, too aggressive, but we're on their side, which is something we want to do is build a relationship. So I've put these together as about the effects you know masks have had on children, um, the biosecurity act, so that businesses can start to empower themselves. Uh, we've also put to, uh, we're also running the rights group, which Tom's been um, very grateful supporting. We run those, uh, we run them on a monthly basis or a weekly. We do zooms and face-to-face, -face, so they're very effective. So this is a really important time where we can start to empower ourselves. 
if anyone's interested in that and also these notices, um, his, these workshops are starting to fund that so we can distribute them. So um, we're going to contact DOT and uh, I think it's expressions of interest if anybody's interested in learning and communication, uh, their rights and also these notices, we can supply them to you and um, yeah, build up some awareness and start actually doing stuff. So that's pretty much it. Cool. <laughs> Uh, just so you know, if you need to get in contact with me, uh, I'm currently banned from Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. So, uh, <laughs> but that's why I've got my own site. Yeah, that's why I've got my own site, which is TomBarnett.tv. Now, the way the world's going is anybody, that, you know, there's a few people in here that are also banned from social media. Uh, if you're speaking truth, they don't really want it getting out. So, if you, the last thing that'll go is emails. Okay, like Facebook and Instagram and even Telegram, that they're not really going to be around forever. But emails will be the last thing to go. So get onto people's email lists. I've got one on my site, tombarnett.tv. Just go to the contact and the mailing list section and just get on the mailing list. I'm going to start a monthly, uh, weekly newsletter. I've never sent out any emails so far. It's literally just there because when these platforms go down, you're probably still going to want to know how you can get access to information or what have you. And I've also got every video I've ever done that's been deleted is on my site as well. So everything that's been banned off of YouTube and everywhere else is still on the site. So you can, there's literally probably 30 or 40 videos on legal stuff on there. So uh, feel free to go on, go ahead and utilize that. And do get onto people's uh, independent sites and email lists because it's just the way things are going. It's, you're not gonna get access to everything so, so easily in the future. Uh, other than that, thanks for your time today. Appreciate the, the attention, and uh, I'll pass back over to Doc. Yeah. Um, okay, I just want to thank you again, Tom, for coming and share with us. Sharon, for what you're bringing and carrying. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, going to businesses and helping them. So what we'll do is we will be emailing and then you're the one that can respond to us if you're interested and then we can um, send out those packs and we can start getting feet on the ground. Um, it's time for action, yeah? yeah. And also um, on that, next Saturday the 29th, there is a um, rally at Broadbench mm. at 12. Um, it's called the Million a Million March um, about you know standing against the vaccination, but it's a whole lot more than that. It's about waking up our community, the Gold Coast, and um, and everyone else far and wide. But this is our community. We've got to get in there and let people know that we're going to support them. And also, if you have a business, I, I need to hear from you because we want to start. Sharing the love and the money amongst us. Yes. Right? It's like people that are awake, we want to work with you. We want to put our money in your pocket. We've got to stop feeding the cabal with our money. Yes. Yeah. Right? We've got to stop going to Woolworths and Coles yes. and Kmart. Let's get and back money. into that. <laughs> and McDonald's. Wow, what if we had a conversation about what goes in the food at McDonald's? Oh, yeah. So that's a creating that community, community. Yes, I think It's about creating this community where we're aware of what one another carry, what we do as a business, who we are, which is what Tom's saying. It's about who we are and being real with ourselves. I'm excited. I've been on this journey for a long time and waiting for all you guys to catch up to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've all been on the journey for a long time. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, we've got another great speaker in a fortnight. Um, emails are going to be coming out about the workshops um, and they're going to be invaluable. So you can't say that we're not putting stuff out on the table for you to come and eat from. And on that note, Peter, who has been uh, supplying beautiful uh, chicken broth, um, and I think she's got more for us when you leave out.
great products. If we ever go into a food shortage, we can just drink her stuff and be fabulously healthy and fit and we'll probably all get skinny. So, and that's probably a good thing. And one more thing. Is there an owner of this drink bottle that's left here that weren't meeting before last? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Winner! We have a winner! Oh, there there. And one more need. We've got a young lady who is having a problem with, uh, with her car. Is there a mechanic in the house? Oh. <laughs> Is there anybody that knows a little bit? I don't know how to start them. Okay, we've got a couple of people. Could, if you could just help our sister.